Welcome to the We Maple Video Show. Today we're here with Joseph Fournier, classically educated as an educator, background in agriculture and former VP of technology in the energy space, and active, uh, quite active on social media and LinkedIn in particular. Uh, how are you doing today, Joseph? Doing great, Matt. Thanks for the invitation. Been looking forward to this for about a month now. So. Oh, excellent. Yeah, we were just chatting about Facebook and um, you got nuked, did you? I got nuked a couple of years ago, yeah. Yeah, yeah 14, that yeah, serves me right for posting and talking about things on my personal profile uh, other than, you know, baby pictures and, and birthday updates and what have you. But, and now I'm on LinkedIn and, and so far I'm, I'm doing pretty good. No one has nuked me, but um, my following is growing fast. In the last few months, I've pushing 4,000 followers now. And, uh, you know, I write for the Western Standard as well. And I tend to write on energy, environment policy, uh, uh, climate science, a lot of those types of topics. And, and um, yeah, my background um, currently is agriculture. I have a ranch out by, uh, by Rocky Fort, just north of Strathmore here in Alberta. And I got a sheep ranch. It's a small one. It's more like a fam family business, you know, a couple hundred, a couple hundred ewes and we sell lamb and, um, but looking to get back in, do a bit of a hybrid role, you know, try to find an executive job where I can work from home and network and travel a little bit while still keep my feet firmly planted in, on the, on the ranch. That's how we wanted to raise our family. So. Is it the chicken uh, and then the hen lays the egg, is that right? The hen lays the egg. And so it, uh, would there be, a, is the is the rooster a type of chicken then? Is that the male chicken? And then it is. And you don't need, a hen doesn't need a rooster to lay an egg. So when, with the, the, the... rooster just fertilizes the egg. So the what came first, chicken or the egg actually that's wouldn't... A, that's a really good question. I haven't figured that one out myself. <laughs> this would be a slight inaccuracy then if it's the hen that actually does the laying of the egg. It's the chicken is just the general, like a human being. You've got male and female. The chicken is the human being, and then you've got the hen and the rooster. Yeah. Well, the fact that you don't need a, a rooster to lay an egg, you know, that's a, something to consider there. <laughs> you know, I don't, I'm no biologist. I've got a little bit of background, but I can't give you a full history of, of when the sex is developed, right? And, and the evolution of, of, uh, of how that type of cellular development happened. You're just joking, I know, and I probably should just joke along. <laughs> Pretty impressive that the, uh, every 24 hours, the energy consumption and what's taken in order for that hen to produce an egg every yeah. single day yeah it's it really is I find it really quite fascinating not just chickens but there are literally thousands of species of, of animals that we have developed over millennia you know a, a very clear symbiotic relationship where through selective breeding we have created a whole new species that are utterly dependent on us and us in turn on them right like you think from the, the domestic dog that that evolutionary history of of the domestic dog is, is is really fascinating and probably no animal in our lives today has had more of a positive impact on on um, our success as a species as a so, as a social group as the as as the domestic dog, we created them from through selective breeding and from from wild wolves or coyotes, right? Chickens are much the same, you know. They in nature, you only lay enough eggs just to give birth, and once you're done, you stop laying eggs because it comes at such a burden. Think of the calcium requirements and the energy and the protein. But in turn, chickens get security. They get guaranteed shelter, they get guaranteed food, and medical issues, any medical issues, they're taken care of. So it's, a, it's an amazing symbiosis, and, and 
Yeah, it's it's um, often makes me think about. You know, we hear a lot about these days about people who are really pooping on agriculture, particularly what they call factory farming or really modernized agriculture, particularly in the animal space, right? Chickens and dairy and cattle. Um, but a lot of times what people will forget is that if we were to suddenly stop sheep ranching, the wool breeds, and there are hundreds of wool breeds, they would die. They would go extinct overnight because they don't shed their wool. And if so, if, a, if one of my sheep get, gets off the ranch and takes off, within a year, they look like a big marshmallow. And then, you know, just the ability to like navigate through a thicket of thorns or willows, they get hung up. They can't run. They'll get, they'll get preyed on really easy, right? So, you know, we, we've selectively bred them for wool. They, they originally, they were like, more like hair sheep, like a deer. Right, finer hairs that would shed every every spring, and then in the fall they would regrow their thick winter coat. But we we bred for qualities of fiber that we call wool today. But in so doing, they lost their ability to shed. Right, so that's just one example, but there's so many along those lines. Um, and then you know, when you're involved in the agriculture industry, you really get to see all these examples of of uh, the, the intimate relationship between Mother Nature and humans. That I think, you know, a lot of people today have, have um, in their metropolitan existence, unless they've got family or friends living out on an acreage or, or, or they come from a farming background, their grandparents, they have no, they're just, they, they've lost that connection to Mother Nature and to the reality of, of uh, animals and the life and death, the birds and the bees. That kind of thing, and and um, yeah, for me it's very important, and it's that my kids uh, have that exposure, even if they don't want to become a farmer someday or a rancher, at least they they grew up, they they saw they they saw the whole life cycle, you know, like yeah, mm. yeah within the last generation or two, it'd be safe to say that we identify as Canadians, but a lot of our parents or grandparents would have immigrated here and become ranchers living off the land that totally. agriculture uh, gene is and then what a natural transition that seems to happen in Alberta where within a hundred years the lot of the people that have been successful in the energy sector their parents or grandparents that was based on agriculture well yeah there was a time when there was mineral rights right uh, that were granted to initial pioneers and so you know, like you have, you always, you see this drive all around the countryside and you see wellheads, gas, hell, gas, gas wells, oil wells on, on ranchers' properties. And um, that relationship between the ag sector and, and the energy sector has always been there. It has been mutual benefit and uh, good rapport. And, um, and yeah, today, yeah, it's so common to see, you know, one or more parents working in an energy job off-site. They come home and do their chores, feed the cows, but at the end of the day, they're out there checking wells for an oil company, right? That diversified income you need it these days, you know, so. Yeah, that knowledge is generally passed down too through families where you, you're not just gonna, for the most part, go get a ranch and then start Googling how to take care of your animals or how to take care of your land. It's sort of bred into you. Well, you know what, the, um, it, it's very true. Nothing beats first-hand experience. But you know, I want to say, I'll say to people that if you have a desire to get out of the big city and do what we've done, for example, um, you don't got to go multi-million dollar operation. You can start, be smart, start small. Go buy some chickens. Go get a, you know, a nanny goat and a belly goat. And, you know, just get your, your, your hands dirty. Learn how to help with the birthing process. Like, you literally are a midwife. I'm a, that's what I do. Like, when, I'm, when ranchers are helping their animals every year with birthing, you're like a, you're a midwife. Like, 
I know how to check is the cervix dilated enough. I know how to, you know, on a you when she's going into labor pains, you know, like I've had to learn by doing. And, you know, you have to have confidence in your ability to learn. That's a probably the most important prerequisite. And don't be limited by fear of failing once in a while. You know, you always try to not fail to the point where you go bankrupt. But, you know, you're an entrepreneur, Matt, right? You know, it takes, you, you have to have a, you have to be okay with the concept of failure and risk and um, just a, a desire to, to grow yourself, you know, through experience. And so you don't have to have it passed down from grandparents. You can learn from YouTube. You know, YouTube's amazing for all sorts of things, right? So at the end of the day, you'll, you'll just, every year you learn a little bit more, a little bit more. And that's how everybody else does. So if people are thinking along these lines, I encourage them to, you know, do, do, do your research and, and um, buy an acreage and see how it goes. You may like it. Where do you think that comes from, that entrepreneurial kind of spirit that we have here in Alberta? You know, the generation or two away, it really took something to hop on a boat and go across the world to an unknown land. No doubt. And then some people are entrepreneurial and some aren't. So do you think it's circumstance? Do you think it's genetic? Or where does that come from? You know what? If you look at the backdrop historically, it was it was famine, it was perpetual conflict, it was you know centuries of 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 that type of uh, social unrest in Europe that that was the fuel under the the rear ends of of our our great great grandparents you know they already had it rough. So, you know, their, their stamina and the thickness of their skin um, was, was already in place. But uh, absolutely, moving out, breaking land, like, the original, you see pictures of the original pioneers, and there's no sawmills to even build a house out here. They were literally with axes and picks, tearing up sod and building sod houses. You know, they get through those first few winters, they're living in earth dust earthen homes <laughs> and back in those days uh, the the prairies were were managed really intensively by the first nations the annual f uh, fires they burned the prairies they burned the foothills <coughs> pardon me to f to stimulate and promote grasslands and uh, and and a grassland dominated ecosystem so there was a lot of trees to begin with a lot of the trees started to get planted after, after the pioneers arrived. Unfortunately, after you know the reservation lifestyle began, and the segregation in society, then you started to see a lot of people planting trees, sawmills, traditional homes could become possible. But those that first generation, my God, like I listened to the stories of well, my my great grandfather is now dead. He passed away at 104, but um, you know he had 12 kids and. There was no Walmarts. You had to, you know, if you wanted socks for your toddler, you had to knit them, right? You'd have to spin your own wool with the sheep wool that you sheared off your animals, right? So yeah, it's it's um, that is our historical foundation. I think you know the we I like to use the term. You probably do too. The Alberta advantage, right? I I you know I know what brought me to Alberta. I came from British Columbia and the Yukon. And I came in 2001. And that's where I came and did my graduate studies. It was in the University of Calgary. But when I graduated from my university in Prince George, uh, University of Northern British Columbia in 2001, we were in, a, in the middle of a major economic downturn. It was like 19% unemployment rate in the Caribou region in North Central British Columbia. What's well, normal for that region? Oh, it varies. It's very cyclical, right? Commodity cycles, forestry. I don't know what it is now, but I, you know, it's done a lot better over the last decade with a lot of pipelines going in and more more capital pouring into the region um, to offset some of the loss of, of uh, the forestry sector in the past. 
you know, 15 plus years ago. Most of my grad class in 2001, probably 80%, they moved to Calgary and Edmonton in, 2000, in early 2000s. Because this is, where the, this is where the jobs were. This is where young people from all across the country were moving. So, A lot of stuff in the ground here in this province. It's got to dig it out, sell it. Oh, yeah. And you know what? The more you look, I mean, you know, uh, the more you look, for resource, the more you find. Like now, you're hearing of companies like E3 up in Leduc area, and and others. There, there's a lithium boom, big developing, old old depleted oil wells. Um, the 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 reservoir water, in here in, in Western Canadian sedimentary basin, it's it's um, it's loaded with lithium salts. And um, you know they're just starting to understand the full extent of the of the resource. But some numbers I've seen is it could place it upwards of a trillion dollars worth of lithium. So you know it's again it speaks to the resource oriented economy and um, very entrepreneurial in, in 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 how we and how we go about doing business. And people aren't afraid of putting a second mortgage on their home in order to put a deposit on a. Three hundred thousand dollar, you know, heavy duty mechanic, shop, uh, truck, right? The trades you see so much in the trades here in our province. Um, entrepreneurial uh, minded people, blue collars are particularly um, entrepreneurial. I find more so than white collar. Yeah, a lot of similarities too between the, uh, you were mentioning some of these farming ecosystems or what takes place on a ranch. And then if we put that in a global context of our energy systems, there's all these different types of energy. And of course, it's become very polarized. I've noticed when I had first reached out to you, some of the things that you'd be talking about online um, can be considered a counter narrative and, and almost uh you know, causes an emotional reaction in people without any room for balanced uh, discussion about some of these topics. What's been your experience in the last couple of years about what you can and can't ask on the internet? Well, the it's I think everybody knows the answer to that question to some extent. You know, these days it's it's topics that are highly politicized, right? When politicians and uh, and their lobbyists really start to pump certain topics there becomes an increasing amount of pressure to toe the line and to not speak against them right so on the energy side you know we um, we have in this province just in the last decade really come under tremendous amounts of pressure to conform regarding exploration of, of our hydrocarbon resources Right, like Alberta is a huge producer. Of, I think f pushing over four million barrels a day of uh, various blends and types of hydrocarbon oils that are, go across the, the largely to the, the Americans. But you know, we're Western Canada. We don't import hydrocarbons. We're fully self-sufficient. And um, but uh, you know, I. Some of the topics that I, I try to purposely put out there, in, for example, is what is green energy, right? Like we, we hear about, for example, we hear about green hydrogen, we hear about uh, pink hydrogen. You know, green hydrogen would be a windmill produce electricity to electrolyze water to produce hydrogen and oxygen gas, right? Um, there's a variety of colors out there to define the degree of greenness. So black hydrogen would be from coal gasification. Black is bad, green is good. And so there's a spectrum. You hear a spectrum of colors being used. And everything is being defined in terms of pr basically just one parameter, which is your carbon dioxide emission intensity, right, per unit of energy produced. And so if something's green these days, it's because, well, it, because they don't produce, they produce less CO2 per unit of energy. Um, so wind is, wind and solar has been 
conventionally, that's the that's the imagery that's used from a marketing perspective. You know, um, I call I often will use the word narrative. That's the narrative that's being produced, right? There's money being spent to convey that that value system, that, that philosophy, right? These large companies, oh, we're just going to have paper straws now, and in some fashion, that's going to make a difference. Yeah. And um, so climate change has been bundled in with environmentalism, has been bundled in with sustainability, with pollution, uh, with pollution all of these kind of not necessarily competing but they're sort of in the same kind of ethos of each other yet you know very different if we define the language so what do you what are your thoughts on how to kind of move forward and i hope a paradigm change paradigm change occurs in the collective consciousness of society we need to wake up and realize that there's such a thing as the law of unintended consequences number one number two there's very few true solutions in life. There are mostly trade-offs, right? And we need to, as a society, quit saying the government needs to do this or the government needs to do that. You know, um, I take some personal responsibility for your own life yourself. Go clean the ditches in the spring with, with some club. Clean up your community. Get active and engaged. Go try to plant some trees. Do get involved in some wetland west restoration work. Get off the line. Quit your bitching online. Get out there and do something. You know, be proactive. Be real, and be happy. And when you when you start doing something like that positively, you'll be a happier person, as will those around you. You know, like why I say that is because you know we have created more problems often in our attempts to do green things. So back in the 80s, 90s, leading up to now, the movement to recycle and categorize wastes and recycling centers, and only to discover in the last few years, where was most of this all going? It was all going to China and Africa because they don't have strict environmental regulations. They don't have stick, you know, workmen's compensation they don't have, you know, the frameworks that we have here. So we'd sell it off to them. Often what they do is they just dump it. Dump it into the river. Dump it into the ocean. Right? Instead of taking our plastic and paper and old couches and diapers and putting them into a, a furnace to produce electricity or chemicals, new materials, they didn't want to do that back then because they're like global warming. You can't burn it. You're going to create CO2. Well, out of sight, out of mind. Let's shift it off to a third world country under the rug. We feel, we, we feel progressive, right? I'll be a bit facetious when I say that, right? But that's what has happened. The average person just formed it out to the government, the municipal powers, said, hey, we're being progressive. I, I like, I don't mind doing this extra stuff. I don't mind paying an extra $100 a month in my fees to the municipality. But at the end of the day, it was just a cartel and they were corrupt and they destroyed the environment. A game of whack-a-mole. That is so, right, you, the, the, the analogy, whacked out of that, that gopher and the, at, the, at the fair and it pops up over here. That all too often is what happens. So, you know, like, Champion for the environment. Absolutely do it, but within balance. We don't have to reinvent capitalism, like the Greta Thunbergs will, will say, right? We don't need to revamp everything. We don't need to, right? Because when you do, you will, if you rush it and if you force it on us through centralized powers where a couple powerful people now dictate everything you will create more problems than you solve there will be more misery and suffering than you solve that's what history shows time and again right so the great reset you know as a bit we hear this terminology it was created by powers western powers western politicians during 2020 it quite you know it reminds me of the great leap forward 
you know, Mao, Mao's controlled China, the Chinese Communist Party in the 1950s. They had a brainwave of collectivist ideas, you know, ban private property, communal farms, you know, there was a whole bunch of measures to, re, to invigorate the economy, to bring them out of an agrarian society, an economy. Um, the industrialization was Mao's dream, right? So the Great Leap Forward, one of the things, just one small but very effective example of the, of the stupidity that gave rise to such m misery was Mao's idea that since sparrows during harvest were found to be eating barley, you know, you picture back in the 50s, these poor Chinese farmers with their handheld wheat thrashers, right? And the sparrows were coming in and they would steal some wheat and fly away. And I was like, think of how many millions of sparrows are there and how many Chinese people will starve this year because those birds ate that barley. So he made an edict, him and his party, go out there, kill, kill as many sparrows as you can. Anyways, that was like, I think, in 1953. The next year, they effectively wiped out massive parts of the, the songbird population. Next year, insects were coming out. They lost massive amounts of their crops due to locusts and, and insect infestation. And it came on top of that during a, a, a very intense drought, right? 30 million plus, at least, Chinese starved to death within 18 months. And Mao did everything in his power to, to pretend it didn't happen. And he re rewrote history books and kept global media away from the disaster of the Great Leap Forward. So I just use that as an example, you know, like it's you, you have completely unqualified people with immense amounts of power who dictate to others how everybody should eat, sleep and go to work. And it is not the right way. The right way is organically people, everybody just working to their own benefit and their benefit being getting you what you want. You have your clients, they're going to pay you to, you're going to produce something of value. You're going to create that value. They're going to, they're going to reward you for that because you're benefiting them. That's capitalism, right? That's free market enterprise. That's human to human, organic, interfacing, mutual benefits. That's millions of minds collectively working organically. We've all seen this, songbirds, right? A flock of 500 sparrows, a thousand sparrows. They can move just spontaneously. It's not a boss. It's like, not like a, like a the geese, there's a boss. When they fly in a formation, the lead one is usually the grandparents or the parents, and the rest of the juveniles to the back. There's a lot of benefits to that, that type of centralized control as an organized group. But big bird populations, no, they just they feel each other. Bats the same way too. Humans need to be that way more so than not. Centralized controls for energy, agriculture, they're going to get it wrong. They are getting it wrong. The energy crisis that we are seeing now, it's not due to the Russian invasion. It's due to a, a decade-long divestment movement led by Greta Thunberg, Justin Trudeau, and David Suzuki's type of activists who get well-funded to pr pr convince people that we have to. There's an emergency. You have to change. Look over there. A tree fell in the forest. That's your fault, right? They use natural events, natural processes, spin it, turn it into a, um, a, a, a lie, you know? Like they'll say, look at the Arctic ice fields. They're in decline since the 1970s. But they don't show you that they were also in decline to the same exact rate during the 1930s to, to the late 40s, right? A 60-year cycle. But if you erase the past, bury it under the rug, then people won't know. They'll just accept, right? So people have been sold the lie from priests and elitists for millennia. 
that your personal sacrifice will control given to me as your priest I will give your sacrifice say a prayer and I will as a result get the gods to send you favorable weather and rain right sacrifice your firstborn step it up right sacrifice your firstborn like the Incas right that type of practice is is innate it's it's that the subconscious in us is for some reason going back to the beginning of the city state and the organized human groups, um, priests have always been saying that to us that your offerings and your sacrifice is directed to me. I will convince the gods, the climate, to be beneficial and convenient for you. We've just gotten sophisticated in this era, right? We've just gotten really sophisticated. And we use different terminologies, but it's the same underlying thing, you know? And, and, um, and I do believe climate change is an existential threat to the long-term survivability of our species. But it's not of the flavor that we're being told. Is it man-made? No. Is climate ch change man-made? No, true natural climate change is, as I said, like Greenland is ice. Most of that ice is formed in the neoglacial. The neoglacial, look it up. It's very clear in the meaning. It means the warmest part of the Earth's climate is behind us. And if you look at the records, the last eight ice ages and the last eight thermal, max, last eight thermal maximums, when the climate goes into a decline and starts to cool, it takes 10 to 20,000 years to reach bottom. But on the way down, you see this very regularly in so many records, geochemical models and sedimentary records. And when you start peeling back and doing some fancy chemistry, you start seeing that as the earth cools, they go through, there'll be sudden periods for, for a century to three centuries it's like a boom. It starts to warm again. And we call those, and those are called interstadials. During an interglacial period, there is on the, on the downward slope, which takes 15 plus thousand years, every once in a while, there is a, a sudden rapid rise in temperature, sea level, you name it. Whatever parameter you want to look for is indicative of warming. These interstadials happen, and then, and then they suddenly plummet again. And when it plummets back, it goes to actually colder than it was before it started to go into that interstadial. Likewise, you'll see that on the negative slope, you'll see what we call stadials. And that's where suddenly it really cools really fast for a few centuries. The Little Ice Age, in, from when I look at the past and the literature, the Little Ice Age was a, probably one of the first major stadial events of the current neoglacial period within the Holocene. So just to get a handle on the language first, so uh, interstadial and then a stadial, how do the two, how are the Warming two? Warming is interstadial, cooling is stadial. It's just, you know how academics are. We like to use big words, lawyers, business people, engineers. And, and words, so are you right? suggesting that right now we're in a, we're in a phase, we're moving towards uh, the cooling phase, as you as you were saying, the the backdrop is the neoglacial backdrop, and that's thousands of years, right? So how does that backdrop fit into the interstadial with the cooling? Um, well, then, so we've heard of the medieval warm period, right? You've heard of the Roman warm period. You've heard of the uh, I think it's I know warm period. There's the current warm period, and that those are just if you look in the, in the paleoclimate literature, then you'll see that those periods, like the Roman Warm period, they were growing grapes. They had beautiful vineyards in, in, in Britain, in Ireland. You can't grow great grind of wine vineyards in, in, in Ireland these days. Haven't been able to for a very long time. Why? Because during the Warm period, the Roman Warm period, that was an interstadial. The, the suddenly the climate started to warm and then it went into the dark ages and it started to cool again so you know it cycles on cycles right you can have um a really 
broad, long duration cycle. And on this, you can have a high frequency, smaller amplitude cycle. In data analytics and in, in, in complex signal analysis, you, the, the mathematical language is there to extract the harmonics in complex signals, right? In time series, whether it's in, you know, in data communications and, you know, like, you know, fiber optic communications, it's the math is the same, whether it's looking at sedimentary records going back in time, you can come, whenever you have time series and ups and downs, you can start to extract information about periodicity, about amplitude, about all sorts of things like that. And um, so the neoglacial period in post thermal maximum in every interglacial, right, which is the, the rise out of the periods where there's ice overheads is um, defined by this type of complex harmonics. So you can have a, a sudden warming event on top of a broader cooling, right? So that's, if, if that analogy helps. If I had a chalkboard, I'd do it for you, and it'd be a little bit easier if picture can convey complex ideas a bit easier. Mm -hmm. I want people to, you know, using these words, if people are interested in them, they can sort of look them up. Mm -hmm. But the literature, there's a lot of, like you Google it now, there will be, you will find 10, 20 hits that will say, the current warming period is not an interstadial. It is not natural, it is man-made. There's even, you Google stuff and they'll say, the Little Ice Age only was, it only happened really in Europe. It wasn't global. And, and, and you'll see stuff like that on Google all the time. But they're lies. They're absolute lies. Prime example, if suddenly Europe was to go through a five-year trend of really warm temperatures, but at the same latitude in the other hemisphere, it, you don't see the same rise in temperature, that doesn't mean that that's not going to have a, the war, that large warming event in Europe is going to, won't have a, a global effect or at least a half a globe effect. And here's why. And you see it in the seasonal cycle, like every year, the, the summer tropical monsoon is the lower latitude zone of maximum precipitation, right? It's so where the sunlight is the most intense, temperatures are the warmest, that's where you get the most of the evaporation and resulting precipitation. So everybody's heard about the monsoon, the famous one in India, right? Every region in the world, in the subtropic regions, has the seasonal, the summer monsoon. The reason why it's summer is because when, say, the northern hemisphere warms, the region, the latitude of maximum precipitation is drawn towards the hemisphere that's warming faster than the other. So in the northern hemisphere, the monsoon is pulled up into lower latitudes from the tropic zone. Right, so if Europe all of a sudden starts to warm a whole bunch, it draws. You can see it in North Africa. You can see the the monsoon in that year getting pulled north up into the Sahara. So is that where where that could potentially go? Is parts of the world that we're seeing now as what we would consider desert could one day be restored to Absolutely. forest or rainforest? Yeah, yeah. As, as, like for example, like if you want to just look at the monsoon and how it changes the global monsoon, how it changes during a neoglacial, well, during the thermal maximum, the, the latitude of maximum precipitation was much higher in the northern hemisphere. And so the northern hemisphere was wetter, received more precipitation than the southern, right? And that's why the Sahara Desert was green and lush and lakes and rivers back 8,000 years ago. But when the earth started to cool, particularly the northern latitudes started to cool, the monsoon started to drift further south. As we near the end of our conversation here, there's a question that I always like to ask is something that we can carry forward and encourage parents to do and something 
um, for entrepreneurs to do. And you were uh, sharing something about catchphrases. Oh, yes. So, like, you see this on, like, LinkedIn, for example. People on there, on there, they're trying to advertise their services as a consultant or as a business marketing. So they're using lingo. And I, and, you know, like lingo talking about, you know, we've been talking about environmental sustainability quite a bit. So there's the usual lingos of green hydrogen, sustainable this or that, you know, I, I know I see it and I get tempted a lot of times myself when I'm trying to advertise my services as a professional to use catchphrases because um, they, they're convenient, right? Because they're familiar and they convey an image. But, you know, I, I but the, the downside to it is that people can suddenly find themselves becoming increasingly disingenuous. Because what happens if you actually don't buy into the underlying emotion behind these catchphrases? But you're just doing it simply just to sell sell service and to stay relevant and to stay engaged as a professional or as an enterprise. I um, dare to be unique, dare to be different, dare to be original, dare to go against the grain. I look at, I saw evidence that your team is like that the moment I walked in the door. Some of your marketing strategies and, and your how you go about uniquely position yourself as a marketing agency like that's be a changer right so entrepreneurs business people if you don't if you don't agree with or you find it something like a catchphrase or marketing ways or business strategies are overused you don't like it i know there's lots of engineers and scientists in alberta doing business who have to go along with the the flow in order to stay relevant and engaged. Don't worry. Try to find a way. Feel comfortable. People will reward you ultimately if you're giving something of value, particularly something that's unique. So I encourage people to do that. I, lately, I've been finding that I'm being rewarded and I'm getting engagements and drawing people to myself because I dare to be who I am, genuine. I'm not afraid and of being unique and different and standing out. So, and parents on the other hand, on the other hand I, you know, I would say, you know, I'm a new parent. I've got my first, I'm a, I'm a late bloomer, 46, and I got a, a 23 month old little beautiful girl. And uh, I, um, I want to be old school as much as I can with my daughter. I want, you know, like, I want her to be modern but at the same time, very old school. And I'm very much favoring old traditional family values and very hard work, personal sacrifice, teamwork. Play only is done after the team has done all the work. So chores and hard, hard work. Children need to understand that it takes effort to create things, to build things, it takes blood, sweat, and tears. In addition to play, they need to understand that. And that's old school, and that's the pioneers. That's what built this country. And um, I, so that's, I, would, I would encourage parents to, to think, of, think along these lines, right? Maybe you don't have to run around like a chicken with your head cut off to dance recitals and piano lessons and, and all these functions, keeping your kid entertained maybe you should make them set the table clear the table put the dish dishes in the dishwasher vacuum the floors help put the garbage away organize the recycling make their room you know teach work ethic in, in your in, in children and uh the way our grandparents were taught the way our some of our parents were taught you know so how the, was that sort of what you were looking for yeah that's great yeah and where can people find you, Joseph? Uh, well, most these days I'm mostly on uh, LinkedIn. It's Joseph Fournier. I try to get a one or two posts a day on there. I, on a 
a range of these topics that I'm talking on here today. And, um, yeah. Got it. Thanks. Anything else to add? No, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, man. It was a lot of fun. This is my first podcast, so it was... Uh, I, uh, we just hung these yesterday. You're our first in-person guest, so wow. they're supposed to absorb the sound. So <laughs> you're going to sound great. I'm honored. Right on. Yeah, thanks. It's a pleasure. Yeah, you too. Cheers. Thanks.